In this video, I want to give you six reasons why the house church model of worship should be preferred by Christians instead of the church building model. Now, there might be some great congregations out there that do meet in a large church building, but for the following six reasons, I think that the home church model should be the preferred uh, model of church worship for Christians. The first reason is that the house church model is more biblical. When you look through the New Testament, you will not find any church that owned a building, a large building. Whenever the church met together, they either met in somewhere like the temple, which was a public place of prayer, or they met in their homes. On the day of Pentecost, uh, they met in the upper room of a house. That's in Acts chapter 1, verse 12 to 14, and Acts chapter 2, verse 1, which was quite possibly the same upper room that Jesus and his disciples celebrated the Passover and the Lord's Supper. Luke chapter 22, verse 12, and Mark chapter 14, verse 15. Now, on the day of Pentecost itself, 3,000 people believed the gospel and were added to the church. And the Bible says that they met in the temple, which was the public place of prayer, and from house to house. That's in Acts chapter 2, verse 46. And then Acts chapter 5, verse 42 tells us that the apostles would go from house to house, teaching and preaching Christ. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it says that the Lord added to their number daily. The concept of the house church is all through the New Testament. Acts chapter 12, verse 12, Acts chapter 20, verse 20, Romans chapter 16, verse 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, Colossians chapter 4, verse 15, and Philemon chapter 1, verse 2. But there is not a single mention of the church building model. You will not find anywhere in scripture where a church owned a large building where they placed lots and lots of people. That's the uh, first reason. Now, there's a couple of objections to this reason. First of all, people try to argue that uh, people met in the homes of rich people and they had large entertainment areas. Now, there's a bit of truth to that, but uh, I've been to the largest house church in Rome. And to be quite honest with you, the entertainment area was no bigger than my lounge dining area, maybe slightly bigger. But we also have to consider that when we look at places like the upper room in Acts chapter 2, uh, this was really similar to our outdoor area, at least in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, and the United States. Um, uh, it's not, it was kind of like a roofed area with a bit of side uh, um, a protection from the wind and from the elements, but uh, the wind could come in quite easily, just like a, an Australian pergola, really. And um, that's why uh, the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind. And the people in the streets heard uh, the uh, disciples uh, speaking in tongues, praising the Lord in different languages. And Peter was able to preach from the rooftop, which was from the upper room into the streets so that 3,000 people could be saved. So I don't think that uh, there's anything different between the upper room and a normal house that we have, uh, at least in the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, etc. Another argument people use is that the Apostle Paul uh, preached in the school of Tyrannus for two years. And this is true, except when you read the text, it's Acts chapter 19, verse 8 to 10, you'll find that uh, Paul was disputing in the school of Tyrannus for two years. This was essentially his evangelism. And that also took place in the temple when you read through the book of Acts. I'll put it uh, in, in the description, the, the reference there. That's the first reason. The second reason is that house churches don't cost anything to start. Uh, there's no building costs, no admin fees, no expensive carpets, chairs or decorations. Uh, people just come into the home. It's, it's, uh, there's no cost to, to set it up. Uh, now, people in the New Testament would give to others who were in need, and from time to time they sold their possessions and their homes when it was needed in order to support people in need. And they also supported elders. Um, but it's important to note that when the Apostle Paul, who was the biggest church planter, when he planted churches, uh, he didn't appoint elders straight away. Now, the ideal is that a church will have elders, and that's what a church ought to aspire to. 
But when Paul planted the churches, he didn't appoint elders straight away. He appointed elders when he returned to strengthen those churches. That was his pattern. It's also worth noting that when the Bible says the Lord is my shepherd and Jesus says I am the good shepherd, that word shepherd is the same word for pastor. So ultimately, if a church, at least at its beginnings, does not have an elder, they are still pastored by Jesus Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit if they are true believers in Christ. The third reason is that house churches are better suited for church services. Now, to the modern ear, that might seem a little bit strange, but that's because we have the wrong concept of what actually takes place in a church service. There are four main activities that take place in a New Testament church. And when you read the New Testament, these are the four things you will see in the church fellowships. The first one is prayer. Acts chapter 1 verse 14, chapter 2 verse 42, chapter 2 verse 44, chapter 12 verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 4 and 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. Now, large churches generally don't practice corporate prayer in their regular service. Uh, what we have instead is somebody praying from the front and everybody saying amen or everybody reading from a screen uh, the same prayer. It's kind of unnatural to have prayer in these uh, church building models uh, as opposed to the house church model where it's a lot more natural for everybody to, to just sit together in somebody's home to share their needs, to pray for those needs and to pray for one another. It's a lot more natural and that's why we see this kind of thing taking place in house churches, home fellowships as well. Uh, the Another thing that they do in the early church services, they had a fellowship meal in remembrance of Christ. It's, rem it's important to remember that the Lord's Supper was instituted during a meal, the Passover meal. That's in uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 22 to 25. You can read that. In addition to that, Paul implies in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20, that the Lord's Supper took place during a meal. In addition to that, Jude refers to the Lord's Supper as a love feast, Jude chapter 1 verse 12. And all through the book of Acts, we read references to the early church breaking bread when they meet together, Acts chapter 2 verse 42, chapter 2 verse 46, and chapter 20 verse 7. Now, large churches don't have a communion meal. They generally have a little bit of bread, a little bit of grape juice or wine, and that's taken and that's the, the Lord's Supper. It's kind of unnatural to do that in the middle of a meal. Whereas in a home, it's far more natural to maybe after we've had a time of prayer to, to bring out the food and in the middle of that meal to, um, to celebrate the Lord's Supper and someone can get up and lead that um, in the, the home church uh, during the meal. Um, the third thing that they did is they read and taught the scriptures. Acts chapter 2 verse 42, Acts chapter 2 verse 46, chapter 5 verse 42, chapter 20 verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17, and 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 19. Now, there is a place for sermons, and I think sermons can be done in both the house church as well as uh, a church building setting. But in my experience, people learn a lot more when they're able to ask questions contribute and engage in the teaching and preaching that is taking place. And that is far more natural in a house church and it's virtually impossible in a church building setting. So I think that preaching and teaching is more suited to a home church than it is to a, a large church building setting. Can you do sermons at a large church building setting? Yes, but I think it's far more natural and far more beneficial in a home church and people will learn a whole lot more. And the fourth thing that they did is they sang songs. Matthew chapter, two, uh, chapter 26 verse 30, Mark chapter 14 verse 26, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19, and Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. Now this one uh, can be done in both settings, both a home church and in a, uh, a large church uh, building. The fourth reason why I think home churches should be preferred over a church buildings is that in home churches there are no mega rich multi-million dollar false teachers. You know, false teachers spread rapidly and gain a great deal of influence 
in large church buildings as opposed to small house churches. I mean, you think about it. How do people like Joel Osteen, Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, how do these people grow to have such an influence across the church world? And how do they get so much money? And how do they spread so much false teaching? Well, what they do is they teach, they teach messages that tickle people's ears. They uh, uh, draw people unto themselves with these messages that people love to hear. They grow bigger and bigger and bigger. They get more and more money from the people. And they use that money to grow their influence across the church world. In a home church, you don't have that kind of thing going on. So that is another reason why I think that the home church model is a better model than the large church building model. Number five, there is more accountability in the house church model than there is in the church building model. Now, when I say accountability, I'm referring both to the accountability of the elders as well as the accountability of the uh, uh, congregants, the congregation members. Now, when you have a large church, the pastor, there's usually one main pastor, that's usually what you see, and he's basically a law unto himself. What he says is law, and he attracts other people to him uh, who basically are yes men. He sets up yes men around him who will accept his views and do things the way he wants them to do. And then he will say, these are the people that I'm accountable to. But in reality, they're just going to you know, back off whenever the pastor says whatever he wants to say. They're yes men. They're people that just want to please the pastor. Uh, whereas in a home church, people can just come and go. If, if you're starting to be a false teacher, if you're starting to uh, I think you're a big shot, People will leave your church and go to another church instead. They'll find another good home fellowship. And I think as well, there's less motivation to, to try to be a big shot because at the end of the day, you're only a, a pastor over a small amount of people. You're, you're nobody special. There's more humility in it in that respect. In regards to the accountability of the uh, other congregants in the, in the church, a pastor that is in the homes uh, is far more intimate in terms of relationship with the members of the congregation as opposed to a pastor of a large uh, uh, church building. Um, you think about it, some of these churches that the congregants probably never, ever catch up with their pastor, very rarely. Uh, even in smaller churches, it is a rare instance that the pastor might come and visit you. Whereas in the house church model, you're always with the pastor. You're always talking with the pastor. There's always discussion going on. And he knows you very well. And because he knows you, he knows your sin. He knows how to guide you. He knows how to correct you. And he knows when to rebuke you. So I think in, that, in terms of the accountability of the individual members, it's much better in a home church than it is in a church building setting. Lastly and finally, the final reason why I think that home churches are the best model is because the house church model is sufficient. If we really believe that the scriptures are sufficient for everything to do with the Christian faith and practice, then why do we need to go and buy church buildings? Why do we need to set that kind of thing up? If we think the scriptures are sufficient, then surely we can continue to do what they did in the New Testament and use them as our example instead of trying to uh, create a big church building and gain a big following after ourselves. Why not go to the house church model? I, I spoke to a pastor recently uh, about church planting and he was trying to convince me that the pattern is for a church to send somebody else to plant a church. And I told him that that was incorrect and I gave a few examples of where that did not happen in the New Testament. Now, if he's going to use his argument to be consistent, then surely he has to admit that the pattern of the New Testament is that people met in their homes. They didn't go out and buy buildings. They didn't go and lease big buildings. They met in homes. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you've liked it, please uh, consider subscribing to my channel. Give me a thumbs up. If you disagree with me, then put something in the comment section. If you agree with me and you want to add something or you just want to encourage uh, what I've, I've said here, then please put a comment in the description. I love to get encouragement from people. And I'll see you in the comment section and you will see me in my next video.